Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. I was an art major in college and have a Bachelor of Fine Arts to prove it. Now, my goal was to be a graphic designer, but to earn that hallowed degree, I created a lot of fine art along the way. Wood sculpting, stone carving, oil painting, and acrylic painting, to name a few. Now, some mediums more difficult than others. My father, himself an art major, when he heard about my Alabama Short Stories podcast, he suggested I look into the story of the woman who painted on spider webs. What? How does one paint on spider webs? Well, luckily, the master of the spider web painting medium spent most of her life in Huntsville, Alabama. Ann Clopton was born in 1878 in Fayetteville, Tennessee. In 1896, she moved with her family to Huntsville, Alabama. Her father, Professor R.S. Bradshaw, was to become president of the Huntsville Female Seminary, one of the first girls' schools in Alabama. As a child, Ann took drawing classes and she showed talent. When she was 11 years old, a teacher gave her art magazines to help foster that talent, and in one of those she read an article about a German artist who painted on spider webs. Painting on webs intrigued her, so she spent years trying and failing to paint on spider webs, eventually mastering this unique technique. The article never mentioned how the artist was able to do this, so she had to figure it out herself. She even gave up playing with other children for a while while she perfected this skill. Spider web painting is not new. Monks and peasant artists in the 16th century would gather cobwebs from spiders and caterpillars. They would build up layers of silk to be the foundation of portraits and landscapes. Now, this technique was unique to artists in the Tyrolean Alps in western Austria and northern Italy. These paintings were small, and there are less than 100 known in existence today. It was only years later that Anne found out that the German artist she was trying to copy was painting on thick layers of cobwebs, which would have made things much easier for her. Through persistence and by accident, Clopton became the only artist who could paint on individual spider webs. Now, Anne initially searched for spider webs around her home. She tried ones from shrubs around the house, but they were too thin and fragile. Anne would go to the attic of her home or the loft of a neighbor's barn for webs. They were usually coated with dust and so weak they would collapse before she could get them home. The only web she found she could paint on was of the common grass spider. Once she found her canvas, she then had to find the right paint. Watercolor paints wouldn't work because the paint would crack when it dried. Oil paints worked best because they took longer to dry, and it still had some flexibility that seemed to work on the web canvas. Once she perfected her process, Anne would collect webs in August and September, which is when she found they were the strongest, and she would make small frames out of cardboard. Anne would then take them to the web, place the frame underneath, and gently capture the web, which would stick to the frame naturally. She would then take a second identical frame and sandwich the web so it would stay in place. She could then store them and let them dry until she was ready to paint. There was a time limit on when she could use her webs. She would collect them in summer to paint on in the winter, and as she waited any longer, the webs would become too dry and brittle to paint on. Early in her career as a cobweb painter, she became somewhat of a joke around town. Not a day went by that she did not receive word from a housewife saying that her house had some first-class cobwebs and she should just run right over with a cardboard square and remove them. They figured if she just found a man, she would get over this silly hobby. Well, the jokes and comments hurt, but Anne continued to work on her art. Painting was her favorite part of the process, but she loved the hunt. She knew the habit of the spiders, and she would go in search of that perfect web. Eventually, her neighbors came around to her art, and they would keep on the lookout for perfect webs and would alert her when they found one. Now, painting on the delicate webs needed a special touch. Anne would dab paint using a technique called stippling or pointillism. You would recognize this technique in the works of Impressionist painter George Seurat. Trust me, you know his work. She found that applying the paint with a stroke would break the delicate web. She also found that she needed to thin the oil to make it flow, and turpentine worked best. Small portions would be painted and then allowed to dry. When the painting was finished, she would frame it behind glass to protect the finished piece. 
The painting on cobwebs was a time-consuming process. A small image may take a month of constant work, while the largest would be about 8 to 10 inches in size and could take as long as three months to complete. When she finally figured out the best way to apply paint, she started work on her first piece. She noticed that the weight of the paint was making the web sag, so she decided to end her work for the day and come back the next. The following morning, she was shocked to find that the spider had come back and repaired the damage by spinning a new web over her work. After spending a couple of hours fixing what the spider had done, her mother called her to dinner and she stopped for the day. Imagine her surprise that on the third day, she found that the spider had again fixed the web. It was then that Anne realized she would have to find a way to remove the web from its original location and away from the spider. This story may be the first time you've heard of this artist, and if you live in Huntsville, you may be surprised to hear that it happened in your town. But back in the day, she was well known. She had been featured in magazine articles and on radio programs. There are even two pictures on permanent display at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. In 1938, she came to the attention of Dave Ellman, host of the radio broadcast Hobby Lobby Show, not to be confused with the craft store today. He invited her to his show that was broadcast from Studio 8 at Rockefeller Center on the NBC network. That next year, she appeared with Ellman again at his Hobby Lobby house at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City to exhibit her paintings. She was also featured in the newsreel Industry on Parade that celebrated her art business as an example of an American free enterprise. In 1940, Universal Picture Corporation sent a representative to her home to make a motion picture of her painting process and story. It became part of Universal's Stranger Than Fiction newsreel, and it was shown around the world to soldiers in hospitals and camps during World War II. Dave Ellman became a big fan because in 1943, she was invited back to New York, this time to appear on a show that had moved to the CBS network. Dave Ellman was a big deal, so much so that when Ellman went on vacation on August 2, 1939, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt accepted the invitation to be his replacement as host. The two would collaborate on shows for soldiers during the war. Even still, Anne had plenty to do that didn't involve spiders. Back in 1926, Anne, her husband, and growing family moved into a house on Triana Boulevard. She took a cedar-lined closet that was just large enough for a small table and chair to be her art studio. She raised five children and taught at Huntsville's Joe Bradley High School for 32 years, retiring in 1944. She also organized and led the first Girl Scout troop in Huntsville for 15 years. And to add one more hobby to the list, she bred Persian cats. Having cats and painting on cobwebs seems like a recipe for disaster. After her time in the classroom, Ann Clopton ran for Madison County Board of Education, the first woman to do so but she was defeated by the incumbent. It is thought that Anne created more than 700 paintings over the years, most of which have been lost. Many are in the collections of private owners. Who knows how many of those are still around due to accidents or general deterioration. A lot of the paintings were destroyed at the World's Fair. People would poke holes in them to see if they were real. The technique Anne devised to paint on a single web is what ultimately will lead to her work disappearing. The German artist of the 16th century built up thick layers of webs for their work, which will help them survive much longer. Anne Clopton died on February 4, 1956, leaving behind her husband James Clopton, two sons, three daughters, 11 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Today, Anne Clopton's home is a local business called Dream Makers, a new age metaphysical gift shop and alternative health center. When owners Ron and Jereen Gray found out about the history of the home, they went about recreating Anne's closet studio and helping to preserve her history. They recreated the closet based on photos. When they moved into the house, they found brushes, paints, and other art supplies that are used in the display. Now it's a small museum celebrating the life and work of Anne Clopton. Painting on cobwebs is an art that has died out. But maybe one day there will be another child who will read about Anne Clopton painting on a cobweb and will want to try to do it themselves. Anne's art legacy is that she left her art and her techniques behind as a starting point. 
I hope you enjoyed this Alabama short story. If you enjoyed the story, do me a favor and tell one friend to give it a listen. You can subscribe to the podcast at Apple Music, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. See you next time at Alabama Short Stories.